It's time for the Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Soteriology 101. Today we're going to play a clip from uh, The Dividing Line with James White because he once again confronted um, traditionalism and um, talked about uh, me and other traditionalists and kind of representing or trying to represent what we believe. He has yet to do so to my satisfaction, at least. I, I have not talked to any traditionalist who feels as if James White understands traditionalism in any real sense of the word or understands um, or at least tries to properly represent what we believe, I think which will become evident even in watching this particular clip from Dr. White and his Dividing Line program a couple of uh, a couple of days ago now uh, from the time of this recording. I'm not sure when this will air, but you can see um, here that it's it's titled, oh, we'll pull it up so you can see it, Synergism and the Perfection of Salvation with Brief Commentary on Maury and the Infamous Hadith, uh, recorded back, um, uh, I didn't have the date, yeah, February 13th, there you go. So I wanted you to be able to go and look for it for yourself, that way um, if anybody accuses us of not uh, playing the whole thing or whatever, you can go back and see it for yourself. So here it is, let's listen to into Dr. White. One of the, you know, I've, I've mentioned that one of the things I wanted to accomplish in the debate with Trent Horn was to once again emphasize the reality of the fact that synergism um, is, there obviously, there's all sorts of different kinds of synergism. There is... Uh, Just like there's all different kinds of Calvinism. Just so you know, there's all different kinds of deterministic ways of theologizing the text as well. There, Gnostics were a form of determinism. Um, Islam is a form of determinism. Um, within Calvinism, there are several different camps. There's high Calvinist, moderate Calvinist, low Calvinist. There are four-point Calvinist, three-point Calvinist. There are infralapsarians, superlapsarians, um, all kinds of different kinds of Calvinist, and they often have intramural debates among themselves, as we talked about many times in our program. Just, just keep that in mind. He's right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying what he's saying is not right. There are different types of synergist or non-Calvinist, is the word he uses as synergist, but, um, but there are different types of non-Calvinist, yes. Sacramentally oriented synergism. There's the barren synergism of the old-style Church of Christ, where uh, Acts 2.38 is the only verse in the Bible. Um, and it's just, you know, one thing, baptism. Well, it really ends up being more than that. But um, all these things, uh, they're, they're, and there's, there can be an entire spectrum in between. But what binds all synergists together is that God is not the one who saves. He makes salvation possible. He aids by some kind of grace, whether it's a prevenient grace or whatever else, but uh, unless you're a full-on Pelagian, uh, you will at least acknowledge the necessity of some level of God's grace. Um, okay, let's, let's make some corrections here. Um, when, when White uses the terminology when he says that Calvinists believe that God actually saves, as in opposition to non-Calvinist traditionalists like myself, who, who don't believe God actually saves, it, it, he's... We've talked about it before. We've talked about the point of contention. What is our actual point of contention? Our point of contention is not whether God actually saves or doesn't actually save. It's who has he chosen to save and why. That's our point of contention. Because White believes that he's chosen to actually save an arbitrary, or you can use a different word if you don't like the word arbitrary. I think you can look up the word arbitrary, and it fits what Calvinism is. I mean, arbitrary means making a choice without any regard to anybody else. It's it's making a choice all on your own. That's what arbitrary means. God's making a choice all on his own without any regard to what anyone else thinks or can, you know any consideration of anyone else. He's making a choice arbitrarily in that sense. Um, and so God can arbitrarily choose a, a certain number of people to effectually actually save, or he can choose to actually save those who humble themselves and admit they can't save themselves and in faith uh, confess and believe in Christ. Um, he's actually saving both groups of people. And so, th again, this happens in debate a lot of times. 
and you've got to watch for it because it, it can make it sound like, oh, wow, that, that's the higher road. That's the better doctrine because they believe actually somebody's actually being saved, whereas those guys over there, they don't really believe anybody's actually being saved. And that's, and that's ridiculous. Obviously, we believe that people who are, are born again, people who believe in Christ, people who are, um, have faith in him are actually saved. Um, and so he, he sets up these false dichotomies. Either, either salvation is possible or it's actual. Either he's, he's, he's making, um, he did the same thing with the plan earlier. When he's like, oh, God either chose a plan or a people. Again, a false dichotomy. In, in Calvinism, God has a plan too, just like he does within our systematic. Um, in, um, in both systematics, God has a plan and he has people. And so, again, you, you set up these false dichotomies to make the other, the other systems sound as ridiculous as humanly possible. White does this more oftentimes than I've probably heard any other theologian when they're confronting somebody that they disagree with. And it's not charitable. We've talked about the principle of charity. We've talked about the rise of cage stage Calvinism and how um, White, whether knowingly or uh, trying to do it, he's leading that charge in a lot of ways. And he's using the kind of argumentation that you see from a lot of the Internet Calvinists that are not as highly educated in understanding of the different doctrines. And I'm not trying to be mean in saying that. I just, you, you, I think people who listen to this know what I'm talking about. There are some guys on there who, uh, just like there's Arminians or non-Calvinists on the other side who just yell John 3.16 at you and don't have any more depth in their conversation, well, you've also got Internet Calvinists who yell the same four or five arguments at you, and, and they're not willing to engage at any deeper level than that. Well, White uh, has a deeper argument than that, but sometimes he resorts to the surface level um, you know, feed feed his his audience kind of red meat kind of stuff, and this works to distract from the actual points of contention by saying false dichotomies out there that God is actually God actually saves or He makes men savable. Well, both of us should be able to say yes, He makes men savable, um, and and we should both be able to say that He actually saves uh, those who believe, um, whether He He causes them to believe or whether they believe freely of their own responsibility. Um, it doesn't change the fact that it's still um, he's actually saving those who believe, um, and so yet you got to look for these kinds of argumentation. You got to kind of kind of weed it out, listen to what they're trying to say, and say, okay, is this a valid argument or is it a fallacious argument? Is this just a fallacy? Is he just setting up something that sounds like it? It makes his system sound so much better that God actually saves in Calvinism, but in that traditionalism stuff over there. God's not actually saving anybody. That's absolutely absurd. And I think any objective ear, even an objective Calvinist, can kind of see through the 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 argumentation of that that kind of argumentation. Now, if if you don't conflate the concept of man's responsibility to repent with God's choice, gracious choice to save the repentant and to forgive those who do repent, if you don't conflate those two things then this whole argument just goes out the water. I mean, it's just gone. Um, and that's what Calvinists do, especially what James White is doing here. He's conflating the, the choice of man to repent with the choice of God to save whosoever repents. And he treats them as if they're one and the same. Um, we talked about this with the prodigal son. It's like the father is completely um, in, in control of whether he receives the son home when he gets there. That's, that's totally and completely of the Father and the Father alone. The Father is the one who choice, chooses to restore a son who deserves punishment. He chooses to put a ring on his finger. He chooses to, th to, to kill the fatted calf. He chooses to do that. He doesn't have to. He chooses to do so because he's gracious. That's completely the Father's choice. But what the Calvinist wants to do is he wants to conflate that choice with the choice of the son um, from coming out of his pigsty, and they treat him as one and the same, one and the same, and they call him salvation, and they say, God is in much control over whether he receives the son home as he is in control of whether that son comes home or not. And he calls it all salvation. They conflate those two things. That's what White's doing here. He's just conflating the choice of, of man to repent and the choice of God to save the repentant and treating them as if they're one and the same choice and then um, belittling anyone who tries to unmuddle the waters by separating those two and make them distinct actions to, to help uh, people realize there are two distinct choices being made. The choice of the man to repent and the choice of the father to forgive. Those are two distinct choices. When you conflate those two and treat them as one, you have the kind of muddled mess that you hear from Dr. White here in this kind of argumentation. And so 
what binds everyone together is that if you're a monergist, God can actually save. If you're a synergist, God can only try to save. And you can give him all the credit in the world that I never would have been able to save myself. That's true. But you also have to turn it around if you're a synergist and say, and God could not have saved me without me. Okay. And that's just plain wrong. God could. God could have could have Calvinistically created the world. In other words, he could have tr- created the world the way the Calvinist pre- presupposes. We actually admit that God could have done it Calvinistically. wouldn't have been that hard. I mean, create a deterministic world where everything happens exactly how you plan it to happen. Even a good computer programmer can create one of those kind of worlds. So that's not hard. God could do that. We, we're, we're not trying to argue that God could not have done that. Like he's not powerful enough to have done that. Um, we're saying that the Bible doesn't reveal that that's what God has done. And so our debate here is not the power of God, his ability to control all things. We agree that he has the ability to control all things. Our debate, the point of contention, again, is over what has God chosen to control? What has God chosen to do? What is God's plan? That is the debate. And so, again, when you paint it like Dr. White has painted it here, He's painting it like either God has all power, i.e. Calvinism, or he's weak and he's namby-pamby and he's trying to save people and he can't do it. And it's, oh, woe is me, I can't do it. And that's non-Calvinism. See, he's just a false dichotomy. It's like if, if, um, if I told, you know, I've used this illustration before, if I told my daughter to go to her room. Um, I have the capacity and the strength to pick her up and move her to her room at any moment. I can do that. And so if I don't choose to use physical strength, if I use other persuasive means, um, other uh, threats of discipline and those kinds of things in order to persuade my daughter to go to her room and she refuses to do so, am I all of a sudden, are all my muscles just disappeared? Do I stop being stronger than her? Of course not. It's a, it's a matter of what I have chosen to do as a free father. I have chosen the kinds of means that I want to use over the, the, the discipline of my daughter. I, I, I have that freedom. He, he likes to, to promote the fact that he believes in the potter's freedom, but yet in his system, God's not free to create a libertarian free world. In his system, God's not free to have free moral creatures in his world because he wouldn't be able to, to have a victory. He wouldn't win. He, he could lose under Calvinism's, um, at least under James White's form of Calvinism's worldview, that it's, it's illogically impossible, according to the Calvinists, for God to have created a world with free creatures, because then, as even White has argued with me, it would be like creating little gods, and he just can't do that. It would be, it would be putting down his own sovereignty. It would, be, it would be diminishing his own power. So he's actually the one who limits God's freedom. I don't. I say he could have created it like Calvinist says he has. I don't believe that's what, that's what the Bible reveals that he's done. He has created a world with free moral creatures. And so this, again, the false dichotomy that that White continues to paint is simply trying to paint traditionalism in the worst possible light instead of actually hitting our our points of contention and debating us versus just tearing apart a straw man. That's, That's the issue. That's the fundamental issue. Does God save you in spite of you or because of you? That's the question. And the monitor just says, wow, you know, if it's up to me, um, I'm toast. Uh, I believe in a God that actually saves. His grace is powerful. And that everything that I do is the result of his grace. Everything I do is the result of his sovereign election and choice. And, of course, it, it also— Okay, so the opposite also must be true. And this is where, this is where the catch-22 comes within Calvinism, which they're not willing to address the other side of that statement. Because whenever you say everything that I do is as a result of God's grace, and that means everything you don't do is a result of God refraining to give you the grace necessary to do it. In other words, our determinism. It's, it's all it is. So when you or any Calvinist for that matter, or any person for that matter, fails to evangelize, for example, if, he, if, if a Calvinist becomes hyper and becomes anti-Calvinistic, ultimate reason, if consistently held within that Calvinistic worldview that's systematic, then it's ultimately because for some reason God withheld the needed grace for that particular Calvinist to be evangelistic. Because everything that that Calvinist does, every action, every choice that they make is ultimately the result of God's gracious action, what God has graced that person to do. 
And it sounds like it's a higher road because what you're ultimately doing, you're saying, oh, well, God gets all the credit for all that good thing, those good things I do. So if I go evangelize somebody, it's because God effectually graced me and gave me the desire to go evangelize that person. So I can't take any credit for it. So it sounds like at first reading or first hearing, possibly, that God is getting all the glory in this deterministic worldview of Calvinism because he's the one who's determining my desire to go and to witness to that lost person. The problem is, is when you look at the flip side of that exact same coin, the logical reverse of that is that when I neglect to go witness to that lost person, it's because God, for whatever reason, neglected to give me the sufficient grace to choose to do so. And so ultimately, you've got God responsible for whether, yes, I go and witness or whether I stay inactive as a hyper Calvinist. God is ultimately the one responsible for every single choice and action, both good and evil which flies in the face of passages like we see in James chapter 1, where it says that God does not even tempt men to do evil. Yet the Calvinists would have us believe that God is ultimately the one who decides every single evil choice that I make by refraining to give me the grace to make the choice otherwise. And again, you you can debate that. You can say, well, that's the way God has chosen to manipulate his world, to control his world, to sovereignly rule his world. You can make the arguments for that. But to hit the actual point of contention, you've got to look at the full-orbed view of both the synergist or the traditionalist is the name I would prefer because I don't like the term synergism for reasons that we've already talked about, and then, and then look and, and compare that to the implications of what ultimately theistic determinism and Calvinism leads to, and then weigh those two options out back and forth. Um, And so just like you have people who reject Christ because ultimately God first rejected them, they hate God because ultimately, salvifically speaking at least, in the Calvinistic worldview, God hated them. God rejected them before the foundation of the world. Therefore, they rejected God from birth, and they could not have done otherwise. And so you ultimately had the responsibility back on God for not granting the faith, not giving sufficient um, um, means of revelation and all those kinds of things, giving all unbelievers ultimately the perfect excuse for their unbelief. Whereas our worldview says that God has sufficiently provided the means by which all may be saved. In the same way, he's provided the means by which all Calvinists, or non-Calvinists for that matter, can understand and, and correctly uh, follow right doctrine. And so therefore, if I follow wrong doctrine, or if Dr. White follows wrong doctrine, he does so by his own choosing, not by God's sovereign will, or God's sovereign meticulous deterministic means. Because otherwise, you've got a really hard (laughs) situation to try to explain why, within the Calvinistic worldview, Arminians even exist. Why does does Dr. Brown refuse Calvinism? And it's ultimately, your answer, Dr. White, has to ultimately be that Dr. Brown and Leighton Flowers and all these other quote-unquote synergists that you're bemoaning are ultimately synergists because God has decreed for us to be that way. And again, you may say that's flattening it out and all those kinds of things, but you've yet to provide any cogent answer, coherent answer to that question. You have yet to provide any kind of a real defense as to the the reason why within the worldview of a, a heart that's been made new. I'm a regenerate man. Dr. Brown is a regenerate man by your own um, estimation. Okay, so are you a favorite child that God has graced you with the ability to understand Calvinism and has withheld that from Dr. Brown? Okay, explain that. Unless you affirm libertarian freedom, there is no way for you to explain with a coherent, logical explanation how and why one regenerate man comes to understand truth better than another regenerate man. With the exception of just saying, well, that's just the way that God's determined it. That's just the way God's done it. And then you've got the situation where you've got to admit, well, God shows favorites. God has favorites. He reveals more truth to Dr. White than other... Matter of fact, it's probably pretty pretty true to say that we all believe that we're, our systems and our belief system, our systematic, is the most correct one. Otherwise, we would we would change our views. So you believe, Doctor White, that your your views are probably the most consistent. Otherwise, you wouldn't hold to them. Therefore, you must believe you're the most favorite of his children because he has supernaturally graced you with the ability to adopt all the right ologies within Christianity. Congratulations! How is that not producing pride? How is that not producing pride to say, no, it's not It's not um, the fact that I could. Uh, I, I make choices within the, the, the Christianity, libertarianly free choices, that God has graced and sufficiently given Brown, Dr. Brown and Dr. White 
equal ability and a, an ability to make choices and to understand doctrinal truth, and therefore they're completely accountable and responsible for those choices to accept or deny certain ologies within Christianity. Um, you, you don't have a, a coherent way of explaining that without libertarian freedom, without the concept of the ability to do otherwise, even within our worldview. Now, what you'll hear is continually, Dr. White will go back to these same basic um, straw men arguments, false dichotomies, um, again, trying to paint one, one a group into a, the, as, as bad of a light as possible and painting um, his view as in a positive a light as possible, which, again, I can understand that within a debate, you want to try to paint your view in the positive light. I mean, I mean it's a given. But the principle of charity and what we learn is to try to represent the view in such a way of your opponent that they would actually say, yeah, that's what we believe. And there's no Calvinist in the world who would ever, non-Calvinist or traditionalist in the world, who would ever describe or explain salvation in the way Dr. White explains our view of salvation. And, and I think that's unfortunate. It all goes back to our doctrine of God. And if we start with the doctrine of, if we start with man and reason from man to salvation to our doctrine of God, we're going exactly backwards. And there, there will be no, uh, absolutely no foundation for, well, any of the things that I believe. Uh, there's no foundation for a belief in, uh, in perseverance of the saints. There's no, no foundation for a belief in the perfection of the atoning work of Christ, uh, anything. If you start with man and then try to use our experience as what will tell us about God. Okay, I, and I don't know a single traditionalist in the world who, who does that. Um, he, he may see it that way, and he can try to make an argument that that's what we're doing, but we, we start with God, too. We start with understanding who God is, and how do we know that? We know that through his word, capital W, Christ. Christ is the God-man. He is the complete and final revelation of God. He came saying many times throughout the scriptures, you heard it said, but I say to you. What was he doing? He was correcting misconceptions about himself, about God. Um, and so you have to view God through the lens of Christ, one who called us to love our enemies, who, who expressed to us what true love looks like, who, who, who taught through Paul that there, out of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, who taught us that God unconditionally loves and that he sent his son to die for the world because he loves the world, um, that he gave his life for his enemies, and that we are to love our neighbor, which is defined as the, our enemy, which means everyone, like we love ourselves that we are to be self-sacrificially giving. So everything that we talk about with God as being a God of love and compassion and grace is starting with God because it's starting with Christ, the ultimate revelation of who God is. And so, to, to again, it, it's trying to paint our view in the back, worst possible light, saying, well, they're starting with man, i.e. starting with compassion and the feelings of what a man might have towards other people and those kinds of things. That's, that's what he's talking about. You're, you're bringing it down. you got to start with sovereign, powerful, omnipresent, omniscient God in order, to, in order to really understand God. And what we're saying is you've got to understand God through the revelation that God has chosen to bring to us. And that ultimate revelation, the lens through which we must view the whole of Scripture, is Christ. And so that's one of the reasons I said in the debate with Dr. White, who kept considered, kept calling my, my doctrine man-centered, man-centered, man-centered. I finally conceded and said, yeah, it is centered on the man Jesus Christ, because ultimately we must concede that God is revealed uh, best through Christ. That's, that's the way we're to understand him is, is through his son, Jesus, the, the word become flesh. And it really, it absolutely determines, if you start from God, you start from a, a position of asking, okay, does the Bible tell me who God is and whether God has a purpose in creation? Um, you know, if you start with Psalm 33, if you start with Isaiah 40, if you start with, well, the entire book of Genesis and God's... Uh, working to uh, establish his covenant and then, you know, working through 
Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then into Exodus. So you hear what he's saying. He's actually saying when he says starts with God, he means start with God from the revelation of the Old Testament and then move into and bring that into your understanding of God in the New Testament. That's that's what it sounds like he's arguing by, by going through these passages in the way he does. And, and I think that's the that's backwards. I think you start with the complete and most the most complete and final revelation of God, the word Christ. And then you can once you have him in light and him in full view, you can go and you can understand the revelation that you see from David. You can understand the revelation you see from Isaiah. You can understand the revelation that you we see from from Abraham and Genesis and all the other writer authors of the Old Testament. He's starting at the wrong place. What he means by starting with God means you have to start with the God of the Old Testament as revealed in the Old Testament. And then eventually you tag on what we learned about Jesus in the New Testament. And I say, no, he's got it backwards. You start with the complete and final revelation of God through Jesus. With, uh, with Moses, and if you see his sovereignty in these things, if you see him saying... And, and sovereignty, keep in mind, sovereignty for the Calvinist means meticulous, deterministic control over everything that happens. That's what it means. Um, and I, again, we've played it on other pod- podcasts before. We've shown it to you before from monergism.com, uh, from compatibilism, that Phil Johnson and, and uh, James White uh, sent that link to me. And I've used that article to show very consistently that compatibilism is, according to their scholars, um, just another form of hard determinism, that everything that happens is according to God's decree, his plan. Nothing happens outside of what God has decreed. He has decided, he has ordained, he has brought to pass for his, his own glory and for his own divine purposes. That is what they mean by sovereignty. For us, sovereignty does not mean meticulous deterministic control over everything. Sovereignty means being able to do whatever he pleases. In other words, God is sovereign in that he is free. Again, here goes to back to his quote of the potter's freedom. We believe God is actually free to do whatever he wants with the world. So we, we look at Psalm 115.3. This is God's in the heavens and he does what he pleases. That is a definition of sovereignty. What is he pleased to do? That's the point of contention. According to the Calvinists, he is pleased to control meticulously every single thing that happens, including the desires and choices of man. We believe, as verse 16 says in Psalm 115, that he has given the world over to man. He has given them autonomy. He has given them separateness, a free will, the ability to make their own choices. So as A.W. Tozer rightly argues, God doesn't decide which choice we'll make, but that we'll be free to make it. And that when we make a free choice, we're not therefore countervailing the sovereignty of God, but that we're revealing God as truly sovereign because we're doing exactly what he created us with the ability to do, make free choices, even bad ones, even those with evil purposes even those with selfish purposes that go against the will of God. God is still sovereign because he decided that we would have that freedom. Not decided which choices we would make, but he decided that we would be free to make those choices and that a God less than sovereign would be afraid to create free moral creatures. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able to handle it. A God less than powerful has to determine both sides of the chessboard in order to ensure his victory because it's the only way he knows how to win the chess game. A God who's truly sovereign, truly free, truly powerful is so good at chess he's able to take on any opponent and beat them because he's better than they are, not because he has to control them in order to get his his way or to bring about his plan. Plus, that undermines the holiness of God, the goodness of God, the, the autonomy or separateness. That's what holiness is. It's a being autonomous, it's separate from his creatures. And thus, if he's truly holy, 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 separate, 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 autonomous, 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 then he is separate from those evil creaturely choices of man. That has to be understood in order to understand the the differences between our two worldviews. Well, you're going to be down there a certain number of years. I'm going to bring you back out, and I'm going to give you this land. And it, it really, really seems like God is sovereign over these things, and, and man is not. But... If you don't start there, then it's, well, it is interesting that monergists... Go back and listen to um, the podcast and uh, video cast I did on metonymy and the uh, idioms of Scripture, especially the Old Testament idioms. And, and Calvinists talk about idioms, too, and different you know, use of um, 
uh, anthropomorphic language, when God changes his mind and things like that, in order to better understand what the authors meant. Well, the Old Testament is full of different um, kinds of idioms and um, different different uh, ways, uh, you know, poetic language, and, and there's there's um, hyperbole and all different kinds of manners of speaking within the Old Testament. In order to do proper hermeneutics, you got to understand those. And in that uh, other episode, I explain how God oftentimes is blamed through certain idioms for things that he did not directly do. And we talked about this before, like the White House has put Iraq into shambles. Well, the White House and Barack Obama didn't um, literally go put Iraq into shambles. I, Barack Obama didn't go over and cut off somebody's head and do all start things on fire. He didn't do it directly. What the person is saying who's making that accusation is they're using a, a known idiom to say that Barack Obama, by choosing to pull out the forces and leaving Iraq into its own devices, letting them make their own choices, that has put Iraq into shambles. So indirectly, the White House has put Iraq into shambles by separating his power and his abilities from Iraq. But it says, the statement says, White House did this. And so if you understand basic English and basic common knowledge and how we understand those things, we don't actually say Barack Obama has been cutting people's heads off and starting things and burning people at the stake and all these kinds of horrible things that are happening in the Middle East. We understand that a, a figure of speech is being used, and we understand that it's the choice of the president to remove um, us as a, a, you know, an occupying force or whatever words they want to use there, um, you know, as a policeman there to keep things in order. He's removed our, the presence of the United States, and because he removed his, his presence, they acted freely, autonomously, separately from the United States. Do you see the difference? Again, that seems like basic common sense, but this is exactly the kinds of things that you see Calvinists often point to. It's, a, oh, look, it says God did that. See, it says God did that. It says God did that. Let's put all the blame, quote unquote, sovereignty. That's the sovereignty of God. That means God is the one who's brought those things to pass. Now, again, I understand that Calvinists um, will use some of the same kind of language and vernacular in explaining some of these things. But when you really begin to press on the two different issues, if you've denied libertarian freedom, if you denied the freedom of man to do other and to choose according to um, their own their own will versus God's will, and to understand that there's a distinction between the ability to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action and the concept of what compatibilism is, which you're always going to act according to the greatest desire. Well, who determines that desire? According to Calvinists, God does. And so ultimately, you're doing exactly what you are predetermined, like a, an instinctive animal is going to always choose according to his instinctive desires in a given moment, because that's the way he was created. He can't do otherwise. Well, we, we're different than animals. We have the ability to choose to act among different competing desires. I can choose to diet, and or I can choose to, um, to eat that food. And so those are influential factors on the will, but ultimately, I'm the determiner. The cause of a choice is the chooser. Calvinist determinists automatically think, much like the naturalist determinists do, the naturalistic, atheistic determinist, they think there has to be a direct determinative cause that's separate from the actual will of the person, that there has to be some kind of influential external factor that causes that person to choose this versus that versus simply saying that the actor himself, the will itself, is the deciding factor. And that's, what, that's why you hold that individual responsible. You don't hold his desire responsible. You don't hold um, um, some, some outward influence responsible. You, you hold him responsible because he made a choice. Okay, and with that, we're going to um, bring this one to an end. Um, I just got started on that video, but I'm trying to keep my videos a little bit uh, shorter and sweeter, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, so we'll pick up where we left off next time. And uh, so join us. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep keep in mind a couple things before I let you go. Um, I'm teaching for Trinity College of the Bible Theological Seminary this next couple of semesters. So if you'd like to join and be a part of one of our classes, earn a degree, um, or our clubs and courses, you can go to sociology101.com uh, slash classroom, and uh, you can find that on our link as well um, uh, in the show notes. So uh, come and be a part of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. Remember, we've got some great programs coming up in Texas. If, um, 
If you're in Texas or if you're not, you can come and join us, either one, some of the apologetic conferences, one coming up in just a couple of weeks here in Austin with a debate with Mike Lacona and uh, atheist Matt Delahante. Um, you'll also uh, get to hear from Mike Lacona as well as, uh, well, I already mentioned Mike Lacona, uh, Matt, uh, Mark Middleberg, as well as um, Braxton Hunter will be there. Um, and uh, Lee Strobel, of course, will be with us again. Um, and then the, the next month, actually May 5th and 6th, William Lane Craig will be with us al- along with uh, Mike Lacona again and Matt, uh, uh, excuse me, and uh, Mark Middleberg. I'll get them all out there. Uh, if you go to texasapologetics.org, you'll find more information about um, all those events and how you can be involved with them. I also want to thank those who are continually spreading the news about my new book, The Potter's Promise. Matter of fact, There it is right there. The Potter's Promise is out and uh, available for those who would like to purchase that. Um, This is the expanded version. Some of you um, learned about the Potter's Promise um, and heard about it um, on Kindle when it first came out. This has actually been, uh, this is actually published through Trinity Academic Press and um, and has um, about twice as much information as the first Kindle version um, has. And so, um, if you haven't picked that up, you can get it on Kindle for, I think it's like $6 on Kindle um, and about $14.99 on, uh, for print, the, this print version. Um, and I uh, want to encourage those uh, and patrons who've uh, been giving uh, to continue to support us and to help us to spread the word by spreading the link to um, our ministry page, as well as um, uh, recruiting others to be a part of our patron team. We'd love to have you on our board with us to help us spread the news of God's love and provision for every man, woman, boy, and girl. Blessings to you. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.